Now, I think we all have those six tools, text, history, tradition, precedent, purpose, and consequence. But I think some of us emphasize the first four and try to avoid the last two. And they think that in doing that, it's less likely that you'll get subjective. I don't think that. I think you have to emphasize in many of these cases the last two, purpose and consequence. And I think there are ways of doing that which are honest, writing down what you're doing, never having a secret or hidden motive, explaining to the reader exactly what's going on in the opinion, that act as a significant check on the subjectivity of the judge. And I think that's just as likely to be objective as to rely solely on the first four. And I think it's at least equal 50-50. And if it's equal, I think that emphasizing the latter is more likely to keep the judge in touch with the legislature in a statutory case, which is in turn in touch with the people, and that is an appropriate thing in a democracy. Purpose and consequence. The problem with purpose and consequence is that they, they invite subjective judgment. Uh, to decide the purpose of a, of a statute, it depends at what level of generality you look at it. Now, you know, what is usually before us is whether a particular limitation in the statute should be applied or not. Is that limitation part of the uh, uh, statutory uh, disposition? Well, if you say the purpose of the statute is to protect civil rights, and if you, if you do not interpret it to have this limitation upon it, you will protect civil rights all the more. I mean, and therefore, you should adopt that interpretation. The problem is that the limitations in a statute adopted by the legislature are as much a part of its purpose as, as is the general purpose of protecting civil rights. No legislature pursues a general purpose at all costs. There are always some limitations. We're willing to do it up to here, but no further. And so to look at the broad purpose, which is what often happens in, in consequentialist opinions, is simply to beg the question. It's to assume the answer. It's to assume that the limitation was not intended because it would limit the purpose. But that's the whole issue. And the same thing is, is, is true for the consequences. Do you like the con How do you decide to decide it? if it'll produce these consequences. Oh, I like those consequences, therefore I should interpret it to do that? Or I don't like those consequences and therefore I should interpret it not to do that? I don't think that's the job of a, of, of a judge. The, 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 the only objective criteria are the words that Congress adopted. And once you get away from trying to give them their fairest meaning, you're, you're in trouble. The normal way in which the phrase is used, though it's become something of a cliche, and so I don't like to use it because it takes on a pejorative meaning, but I think that underlying the idea was that if you go back to the end of the 18th century uh, and you examine what the founders thought, say, about the Commerce Clause, they didn't think of the internet, and they didn't think of television, and they didn't think of the radio or automobiles, etc. But they wrote a value into that clause, and that value is permanent, like the value under the First Amendment is permanent. Free speech is a value that's permanent. But how you apply that to a world where social conditions and physical conditions and every other condition is changing continuously, and how you take a, a document that, that applied to four million people or so in 1789 and today has to govern a continent of 300 million people of every race, every religion, every point of view. And you know, with 300 million people, we have 900 million points of view minimum. And uh, how you do that is not obvious. And the Constitution in the application of it adapts to the circumstance in order to keep the values the same. Now well, that's the kind yeah. of thing that underlies that notion cliche though it is, and I think that which underlies it is certainly valid. 
if, if, all, if all you meant by the living Constitution is that the Constitution has to be applied to new circumstances that were not envisioned at the time of its adoption, I wouldn't give it the name living Constitution, but I wouldn't disagree. Of course you have to figure out how the First Amendment applies to new technologies, to radio, to television, and so forth. That, that's not what the fight is about. The fight is about taking pre-existing technologies, pre-existing realities that were there at the time the Constitution was founded and changing the answers. I've sat with three colleagues, living constitutionalists, who believed the death penalty was unconstitutional. Nothing has changed. No technology uh, alters whether that's a constitutional punishment or not. And yet the living constitutionalist could one day say, ah, because of the new circumstances of our 300 million people, we feel differently about it today than we used to, and therefore I am going to prescribe from the bench that you cannot have the death penalty. That's the kind of thing that I do not agree with in, in the living constitution. It applies not just to the death penalty, it applies to abortion. Abortion existed then, nothing's changed. Nobody thought abortion was, was uh, pro prohibition of it was, uh, was unconstitutional, but living constitutionalists say it is. The same thing applies to, you know, prohibition of homosexual conduct. It, 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 it's not the disposition I'm concerned about. If you want to change things, if these 300 million people want to change things, you don't have to use the Constitution to do it. Use the legislature. That's what we do in a democracy. And it's very undemocratic for the court to say, make the change. It's quite possible for the people to abolish the death penalty, to pro permit homosexual conduct, or for that matter, same-sex marriage, and, and, to, and to permit suicide and all sorts of things. The issue is whether a judge can say, the living constitution has morphed. And so what used to be okay is now not bad, uh, is now bad. That, that's, that's the living constitution I'm talking about, and it's, it's the one that I wish would die. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.